And um, I just want to just point out just a, a, a few things um, to, to just let you know that we are indeed aware of the fact that um, how Father's Day uh, affects people in a different way. You may have been blessed with an amazing dad who showed you love in too many ways to count. Perhaps you had a dad that was often aloof, absent, abusive, or you never even got to meet him. Know that there are many people who share your pain and even more who are praying for you through what can be a very painful weekend. Pray for them. Forgive them. Now forgiveness does not make what they did okay, but it makes you okay. Think of the people who were like a dad to you and thank God for them. And if you lost your dad recently, know that we are praying for you. I want to talk to you today about our relationship with God and how important that is, that we know where that's at in our lives. And not only that, but the title that I gave this message is Knowing Knowledge of God. Knowing God. It's very important to us to know who God is and to know God in a very, very intimate way. The reason for that is that there are perhaps a lot of people who know about God and they can tell you and quote theology and all kinds of things about God, but that's the extent of it. They know a lot about God, but do not know him personally. And it's important for us to come to that place because until we come to that place, we will always be searching and we will always be looking and never really satisfied until we come to that place of knowing God. And the Bible, all 66 books of the Bible, the Old Testament and New Testament, is a call to us to get to know God. We just completed in Sunday school the Old Testament. We went through the last three books of the Old Testament, ending in the book of Malachi. And all through the scriptures, what our experience has been is gaining a greater knowledge of who God is. Gaining a greater knowledge about God. And what is the purpose of that? Why is it that it's so important and the scriptures call us to a greater knowledge of God? Because that's where the intimacy with God begins. There is no intimacy with God unless there's a knowledge of God. It's when you get to know someone is that when you begin to appreciate that person, love that person, and enjoy that person. We cannot enjoy God. We cannot appreciate him. We cannot really truly love him unless we know him. Bruni got a good look at me and she goes, mmm, wow. And she got excited at what she saw. But she didn't know that this 6 1 who he was and whether she can love me. 
she fell in love when she got to know me. Because she went mmm mm, to Warren Beatty. <laughs> she thinks I didn't forget that. <laughs> but she didn't know Warren Beatty. She could never love Warren Beatty. Not while I'm around. <laughs> But she's able to love me because she knows me. We are able to love God when we get to know him. And that is what the word of God is all about. It's trying to bring us to a knowledge of God. Why? So that there can be intimacy. That's why God gave us his word. He gave us his word so we can study it and we can get to know him and know him in a real way. But it even goes beyond that because the scriptures tell us that we can know God in a personal way. We can know God in an intimate way. That's the beauty of it. We humans are the only ones that have really that capability. God spoke the heavens and the earth into existence. God spoke the trees and the rivers into existence. He spoke them into existence. God spoke the animal kingdom into existence. But when it came to man, humankind, he didn't speak Adam into existence. He created Adam. He formed him and created him just as he created Eve. He formed her. He created them he, into his image. And the reason for that is because he wanted to talk to someone. He wanted to have a relationship, a personal relationship. And that was the case. God, the Bible tells us, would come into the Garden of Eden and in the cool of the day, walk with Adam and Eve and fellowship with them. He loved that. He looked forward for that. That's what he wanted. He saw humankind as his crown creation. What that means is this is the greatest thing he's ever done. And he fell in love and still loves. And even when man rebelled and sinned and was separated from God, kicked out of the Garden of Eden, God did not give up on man. He did not give up on us. He sought after us. And that's what you find in the Old Testament. A God seeking after us. A God looking for that relationship once again. Looking for that intimacy. He tells Moses to build a tabernacle. Why? So that he can come and dwell in that tabernacle and be with them and travel with them and experience them and they can experience him. David did not want to leave the tabernacle because he understood that that's where God's presence was and he wanted to be in God's presence. But more than David wanting to be in God's presence and more than we wanting to be in God's presence, God wanted to be in our presence. Can you imagine that? God Almighty is seeking intimacy, is seeking that personal relationship with us. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. The story is told of a king who was in his throne. He was in the room where his throne is and he's there holding a council with his advisors and noblemen and minister statesmen. Suddenly, there was a bang and a clatter at the door of the throne room. 
And all the eyes were turned to the doors and the noise. And a little boy comes busting into the throne room and running in. And one of the guardsmen tried to stop him and said, hey, lad, you need to stop there. You can't come into the king's room like this. And the little boy looked back laughing at him and says, he may be your king, but he's my father. And the king was with his arms wide open right in the middle of the meeting and grabbed his little boy and hugged him. A child of a king is always outranks any nobleman, advisor, minister, statement, any dignitary. A child of a king outranks them all. Are you hearing me, folks? And that is the position that we have with God. And this is what the scriptures and Jesus is trying to teach us. We live in a world. We live in a fatherless world. We live in a fatherless America. I am not going to go into all kinds of statistics. I've read so many this past week on how indeed we live in a fatherless world. And in my readings, I found that there are people who went after, who are in desperate need of a father relationship. The world is in desperate need. There is a search for father. There is a search for that. And, you know, I, I don't have the time to, to unwrap this the way I would love to, but I have to just give it to you uh, 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 in, in, in almost a nutshell. Because that's what it is when we consider the whole scriptures and the word of God. But all through the Old Testament, that is what the teaching is. It's the teaching of God who wants to be a father to his children. And also we have the New Testament and we have a Jesus who speaks of the Heavenly Father and speaks of a relationship. It was almost as if Christ came into the world to show us that, hey, you could have a relationship with God that is intimate, that is personal, that is as a child and a father. That's what Jesus was teaching. Now, I know in the last few decades, people have had a hard time with that. Modern thinking, modern uh, scholars and others are saying, you know, uh, uh, you know, let's get rid of the word father and all that. Matter of fact, if they can get rid of Father's Day, they would. But it's here. And it hasn't gone away. And the reason it hasn't gone away is because there is within each, every human being a searching for a father. There is that searching for that kind of relationship, that kind of intimacy that the scriptures describe to us. And so Jesus comes and introduces it and introduces that relationship. Even it got to a certain point that when they, the, the time with the disciples was almost over, one of the disciples said to Jesus, we are very much impressed with you. We are very much impressed with the miracles. We are very much impressed with your words. But you know what? You know, you have put within us, or at least you have stirred within us a desire to know the Father. 
the one you pray to, the one you talk to, the one you do everything he asks you to do. We want to see him. Please show us the Father. And it will suffice us. And we'll be okay. Because you yourself has stirred that up in us. And Jesus looks at them and says, hey, haven't you been with me long enough? And don't you know that I am in the Father and the Father is me, that I came here to introduce you to him, to introduce the Father to you so that you may know him in a personal way? Because I know that's your greatest desire in life is to have that intimacy and that relationship with him. Are you with me? If it was classified as a disease, fatherlessness, fatherlessness would be an epidemic worthy of attention as a national emergency. Just one statistic. According to 72% of the United States population, fatherlessness is the most significant family or social problem facing America. I don't have to go into statistics. Look it up yourself. And you will see. In the New Testament scripture that we read, Paul is praying. He is praying for the church. And I don't think he was just praying for the church of Ephesus, but he was praying for Meadow Hill. He was praying for the church today. And here's part of his prayer. He says, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. And in a paraphrased translation, it says, as you come to know him personally. So what is Paul's prayer? His prayer is that God, the Lord Jesus, the Father of glory, may give them a spirit of wisdom. What is he saying with that? Again, I don't have the time to give you the whole exegesis and, 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 and interpretation of that. But basically what he is saying is that he prays that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, will give us a revelation of who God is. That the spirit of wisdom, the Holy Spirit, he's speaking of the Holy Spirit, will help us to come to that knowledge, to come to a revelation and know God. And know God in an intimate way. That comes by way of the Holy Spirit. That comes by the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Jesus said that it's the power of God that will help us become children of God. Listen carefully to me. Some of you might be offended by what I'm going to say. Not all humans are children of God. We are all creations of God. But you become a child of God, the scriptures tell us in John, the first chapter. When you believe in Christ, you become a child of God. And Paul the Apostle unwraps that for us and says that it is only through the Spirit of God that our soul and our spirit can cry, Abba, Daddy, Father. And that comes.
comes by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. And look what he says. He says that he will give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. Know him in a personal way and get to know the power of becoming a son and a daughter of God. This is called intimacy. The word knowledge, to have a knowledge of God, that word knowledge in the Greek is epignosis. And epignosis, what it means is that they would know the deep things of God. You can know the deep things of someone when you get to know them personally. Are you hearing me? So what's the bottom line here? The bottom line is that he wants to know how, he wants us to know how important we are to God. We are his inheritance. We are his possession. And he is our possession. Are you hearing me, folks? Here's what I'm praying and hoping through this message. That some way, somehow, that would wake up that hunger and thirst in each and every one of you to want to know God even better. Not about God. Not about the things of God. But to know God himself. To know him in a personal way. That was the prayer of Paul the Apostle in Philippians 2. When he says, oh, that I might know him. Oh, that I might know him. He's talking about an intimacy. He's talking about a closer walk. He's talking about something that goes beyond religion and beyond just coming to church every Sunday. But having an intimacy, a relationship with God, that it's an ongoing thing. The psalmist said, my soul thirsts for God, but it thirsts for the living God. What are you talking about? He's talking about a living experience. He's talking about not a one night stand. Not a one night experience or one Sunday experience where the hairs in your arms stand up and you go, oh wow, that was so cool. But he's talking about an ongoing experience. He's talking about a daily experience. He's talking about waking up in the morning with God. He's talking about walking with God all day long. He's talking about going to bed with God. And waking up again in the morning with him. Having a daily experience with God. Last Sunday before we evacuated this building. I don't know how, if you guys uh, didn't pick it up, but uh, last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday. How many know that? Do you know what happened at the day of Pentecost? They were in the upper room, 120 of them, and the Holy Spirit came down, as I spoke to you last week, and filled the room and filled them. <laughs> filled them so much so that they couldn't contain themselves and they ran outside. Are you hearing me, folks? It took some gas to get us out of here. By the way, that was taken care of. New pipes were put in. It's all done. You don't need to worry about that again. But the Holy Spirit inside of them moved them outside. And who was out there? 3,000 hungry souls was out there. And when they heard the gospel, they too received Christ in their lives. And 3,000 was added to the church that very same day. Are you hearing me? And so what I was going to preach to you last week, uh, which was the Old Testament passage, was Ezekiel uh, uh, 47, which speaks about a river coming from underneath the temple. And that river going out and healing the dry lands, putting fruit in trees. And everything that was dead was coming to life as the river touched it. And then the scriptures tell us that Ezekiel had a vision. And the vision he had was a river. And he walks into the river and he's, his ankles are covered with the river. 
And then he walks even more into the river and his knees are covered. And then he keep, continues to walk into the river and the river is up to his waist. And then he continued to walk into the river until the waters were over his head and he had to swim in it. Many of us have had an ankle experience and that's all we've had. Many of us have gone a little deeper. We've had a knees experience. And some of us has even gone deeper. We've had a waste experience. Where you stop eating and start fasting and you know, well anyway, no, no, let me not go there. But many of us are lacking the experience of Ezekiel of having those waters overrun him to the point where he is soaked and he has to swim through it. Let me tell you what the whole analogy and message in that is. Seeing a river coming from underneath the temple. I don't know if you know it or not, but you, you are temple of the Holy Spirit. You are God's temple. Are you hearing me? And Jesus, being at a feast that involve a priest taking a, a, a pitcher of water and pouring it into a, 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 a pail, which was part of the feast. But Jesus understood this even deeper than those who were watching it, who saw it every year. And as Jesus is sitting there, his chest is about to burst. And he can't take it anymore because he knows what this is all about. Because every single feast in the Old Testament, every festival, every, every, pa the Passover, everything speaks of Jesus. All of the sacrifice speak of Jesus. And so now Jesus is watching this festival and all of a sudden he jumps up to his feet. This is in the Bible. John chapter 7, verse 37 to 38. He jumps to his feet and says, Whoa! Everyone who thirsts, everyone who thirsts, let him come to me. And out of their innermost being, out of their belly, out of the innermost parts of them, shall flow rivers of living water. You're not listening to me. God wants to flow through you. Let him fill you with his Holy Spirit. Don't settle for a mediocre Christian life. Don't settle for a shallow Christianity, for religion. I was going to say something, oh, and that would offend a lot of people here and in the audience out there. But religion stinks. Religion stinks. The father put an ad in the Madrid newspaper. And the ad read, Dear Paco, Meet me in front of this newspaper's office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. On Saturday, 800 buckles showed up looking for forgiveness and love from their father. Today, in many a church, the sermon of the prodigal son is being preached. And we know that story, we know it so well. Did you know 
that that is the greatest short story ever written in history that not Shakespeare played on nobody has ever written a short story that can come close to the prodigal son nobody has ever told a great story it's the greatest short story ever told the son leaves home squanders his dad's money and then comes to his senses and says, I need to go back to my father's house. In my father's house, the servants have a better relationship with him. They eat well. He cares for them. I'm going to go home. And I don't think my father is going to accept me because I rejected him. And you know the story. The father, every day, looking over the horizon, hoping that the son will come home. And one day, he sees a figure. And the, Bi the Bible tells us that this man, who was a rich man, did you know that rich men never run? unless they're in a marathon. Other than that, they don't run anywhere. They walk. They're too cool to run. They're too rich to run. You run. And if you meet with me, you better run and get here on time. But me, I get there when I get there. Because I am rich. I am powerful. And powerful men never run. In those days, a powerful man, you will never see them running. Hey, the Bible says that the father took his dress, tied it up, and ran. Are you hearing me, folks? Ran to him. He ran to that boy. And when that boy saw his father running towards him, who knows what was going in that boy's mind? He says, he's coming to beat me up. He's coming to tell me to get out of here and don't come back. He's going to reject me. He is actually running towards me. Oh, what am I going to do? And the father gets up to him and grabs him. And begins kissing him on his dirty, filthy, stinky, smelly neck. And hugs him. My boy is back. And you know the rest of the story. But this story is not just about a prodigal son who left the home. Or the story of a father, it's love. But it's the story of a son who never left home, who never was home, who never felt at home, who never knew his father. And there are many in the church today, Sunday after Sunday, they know about God, but they don't know him. I want to challenge you to be a person that says, I am not satisfied until I get to know God in a real way, until I experience him in my heart, until he is everything I want and everything I need, until he is mine, all mine, until he is in me and I in him until I'm his possession and he's my possession. Bow your heads with me, please. You say, how can this be? How can I have this experience? Surrender all to Jesus. Do what Paul the Apostle commanded in Scripture. Be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. 
and be not drunken with wine where there is excess and debauchery. In a modern translation it says let not your stimulation come from wine but let it come from the Holy Spirit. What is stimulating your life? What wakes you up in the morning? What gets you going during the day? Is it those pills? Does your life only run on Dunkin' Donuts? Or is it the Holy Spirit that stimulates you to go on and to live and to live for God and to allow that river to flow through you and touch others? Oh, I pray that that is our experience. I pray that we will be a people that are not just satisfied with just going to church, singing a few songs and going home and thinking that we have got one God's favor. Let us pray. Lord, it's not my sister, not my brother, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. We need you, Lord. We're tired of religion. We want a relationship. We hunger and thirst after you. And you said, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. And if we seek first the kingdom of God, then all things will be added to us. Help us to put you first, God. That our hearts would be more about you than about ourselves, than about anything else. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for giving your life for us. Save us. Deliver us. We surrender our all to you, Jesus. Amen.